Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vowels and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 55, we're going to take a look at the Yuri single-ended monoblock finished. It, the design is finished and we're going to go over the specifications. And I got a surprise guest. So, but first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult the professional technician when in doubt. It's been a very busy week on the lab bench, with the work progressing on three kit amps all at the same time, while I'm trying to maintain orders for the, for the store. This week, we made some tweaks with the aid of a full frequency analyzer that my son Charles set up. Up till now, I relied on basic electrical measurements, my scope, and critical listening sessions to voice my amps. Voicing is just the way to describe how the amp sounds. For example, if you want a rich, full-bodied mid-range, you might want to bring up the second harmonics. And we'll talk about that more in a minute. With this equipment, we now have the ability to see the entire frequency spectrum in minute detail and best of all, compare it to a previous version of the amp. All these long days of work have allowed us to complete the URI monoblock kit amp design. The first amps will go out to test builders only. To qualify as a test builder, you need to already know how to solder and use a volt ohm meter. Now, I'm not saying you need to be an expert at soldering. Just know the basics and have some experience. Here's the deal. You pay the full price for the amp, but to thank you, we supply the amp with a free set of quality tubes. For more information, including pricing, just send me a note using the store contact page. Now, this is not a scheme to sell amps. This is a one-shot offer. I really could use some test builders I'm not going to release the amp to the public until we've done some test builds and we've ironed out some some glitches. Maybe maybe there'll be a little tiny hiccup that people don't understand in the build video. There's going to be a build video for each and every kit amp. So you'll be able to follow me along. And if you're an experienced builder or more experienced, you probably just take the schematic and speed ahead of me and have the thing mostly complete before you have to go back and figure out what the heck's wrong. <laughs> what episode was that when, when Jim wired up those sockets? Anyways, um, now for the first time ever, I'm going to invite someone else on to Tube Lab. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce my son of many skills and now an associate partner in Vals and More, to further help explain the testing numbers. Come and say hello to everyone, Charles. Oh, hello. Well, welcome aboard. It's so nice to have you. Well, it's nice to be here. Okay, well, let's clear the decks here and get this big beast out of the road. Okay, well, Charles is gonna talk about the specifications because he did the vast majority of the work. We worked together on it, but he really was the technical guy. So let's zoom in, and now if you don't quite get everything on camera, don't worry. I'm going to upload everything into the store information, and it will be below the video as a link as well. So you can go ahead and download it and, and look at it at your leisure. So so this is the URI 6P7S, revision 7.1, and this is the version that's going to become the kit end. We reserve the right, of course, to make minor uh, production revisions, but this is a, as good as we can get this amp at the moment, and it sounds great. So it's an SE, or single-ended, pure class A, zero feedback power amp. It's a mono block, so you'll need two of these if you want stereo. It's rated at 2 watts RMS. It has an input sensitivity of 1.6 volts RMS. What's the input sensitivity about, Charles? So the input sensitivity is the maximum input level that you can put into the amp before it starts clipping. So that sounds like it's probably, it looks like it's probably pretty low, right? It is fairly low. So it's a, got a, so it's a sensitive amp. So that's, that's a, I think that's a good thing. It is. 
signal to noise ratio, you've got two numbers here. Yes, so this is going to be a little bit different from most amplifier spec sheets. You're going to see two different numbers here. One of them is representative of the second harmonic noise floor, and the other one is representative of the noise that we don't want. Right, okay, and we've taken this all at one kilohertz, right? Yes. Okay, input impedance is 470k ohm, and that's going to be pretty standard for power amps. They're going to be, what, 470k to maybe a meg, something like that. And output impedance, what's with the two different numbers? Well, it's switchable, of course, between 4 and 8 ohms, depending on the type of speakers you own. Right, and these are the two most common, so that's great. And here we've got the tube complement. The driver tube is is the CV6, but it can be any number one of these. These are all the different numbers. It's the same basic tube. There's some minor variations in output. Uh, they all sound great in the app. Um, and down here, the that only takes one power tube, it takes uh, the 6P7S, and I've talked about the tubes in previous episodes, so let's just keep rolling along here. But down here you've noted the actual tubes that we've tested the amp with. Yes, so to go back to other spec sheets, most manufacturers don't tell you which tubes they're testing their amplifiers with. And with this whole sheet, you'll see here that we want it to be as specific as possible. Oh, great. Okay, let's just slide it up a bit so people can see further down. So, output power. Basically, this is has a maximum output of 2.2 watts RMS. And that's, that's it, right? At this point, she starts to clip. Yes, 2.2 watts RMS into an 8 ohm load. And we did some listening tests in which we actually measure, we measured what our volume position was with uh, with one of our kit preamps, and you were amazed at, list, at our normal listening level in which the room is full of sound. Now, it's a smallish listening room, but you were just amazed at how low the wattage output was. It was decimal zero something, wasn't oh, it? Absolutely, yes. It was, it was under one watt of output, and I am amazed that anybody with efficient speakers would need anything more than a couple of watts to fill a room. Yeah, and that's a good point. This amp is, is all of these small single-ended amps are all designed for fairly high efficiency speakers. So it'll start to sing. It can it probably can drive, you know, a big inefficient speaker, but it won't sound its best. It's really designed for a 90 dB efficient speaker or more, and preferably about 93 dB and more. At 93 dB, I did a, a live listening test, mostly just to, to, to make sure that at maximum volume that things were working properly. And I had to wear hearing protection <laughs> or I would be deaf. That's how loud this thing got. Okay. Now, now speaking of dB, you're, you're going to see on the sheet a lot where we mentioned dBr. And most spec sheets, you'll just see that listed as dB. What dBr is, is the dB level relative to the signal. It's assumed in most cases but we want it to be specific here. Okay. So uh, further in the video, we'll be saying dB, but what we're really meaning is dBr relative to the signal. Right, excellent. Uh, one of the things that I do on TubeLab constantly is I try to, besides neatenizing my pages on camera, I try to clarify terms and I try to be dead clear about things. Doesn't mean I don't, you know, F up every once in a while, because <laughs> this is a, it's basically a one-shot live take. So. Um, and we'll see how it goes with two of us, but uh, clarity, I think, is just so important. Okay, so so we got here, we got total harmonic distortion, and you got a whole whole bunch of numbers. Maybe you can walk us through them. So this is where we were getting those first two signal-to-noise ratio numbers from at the beginning. You can see here we have total harmonic distortion at the second harmonic, and total harmonic distortion at the second at below the second harmonic. And we've split this up across three different frequencies, 40 hertz for the low end, 1 kilohertz for the mid-range, and 10k for the high range. Right. So, and I think the reason you split it up is because we, we in this amp, we consider the second harmonic beneficial. Absolutely. And we'd like to show the noise floor accurately below that. Okay, so let's just look at the 1k, because that's 
generally a lot of testing is done sort of in the middle of the music spectrum and this is let's call it the very top end of the mid-range or the very bottom end of the treble um, so what we've got here is a 0.702 percent of distortion to the second harmonic which is not a great number but it's not a terrible number but we consider the second harmonic to actually be purposely placed in this amp so when we get down to below the second harmonic holy macaroni look at this we're 0.014 percent distortion right yeah and that's very good and we'll have a visual of that in a minute so you can really get an idea of how low that is right right okay there's more to come and then we have the frequency response here and this is just pretty straightforward right yes so at 25 hertz to 20 kilohertz we have minus one dbr and that's the worst it does right that's the worst it does in that frequency range okay and we'll see that in more detail and then we've you've gone ahead here and you've shown the minus one db low frequency point mm -hmm. which is 24.47 which is amazing uh, just to give you an example if i'm running a sweep in my system and uh and my system is a is a very responsive full frequency system i don't hear anything until about just before i hit 40 hertz most most music is recorded above 40 hertz there's very little below it and there's there's actually very little 40 hertz signal that you'll ever find anywhere maybe uh you know in an organ recital with some of the very low notes you'll start to hear those low notes but so we're we're our, our, our minus one db B, D, blah <laughs> i'm tongue-tied charles the minus one db down point's fabulous yeah. and and likewise so is the 20 kilohertz uh minus db down point which is minus 0.088 right and of course again most people don't hear uh, above 10 or 11 K uh, now the sounds that are above 10 or 11 K our brains might actually interpret them a little bit and they certainly help to give sort of a sense of space and air and and life to the music so it's important to not cut off at 11 K and to fully reproduce them and we don't even hit minus one db at 20k do we no no it performed very well there and um I, I don't think we can have any complaints about it okay let's keep moving okay we're gonna have to speed up a little bit or this is going to take forever <laughs> let's just back up a little bit i always try to keep these videos under 25 minutes so what do we got here so this is a visual representation of the frequency response from 20 hertz all the way up to 20 kilohertz Right, so this is the slope, this is the low dB down point that you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So we really don't start rolling off till just maybe a hair before 40. And the minus 1 dB down point would be way over here at, what did we say, 24 and a half hertz, something like that? Somewhere in that area, yes. Right. And then up here, you can see at the other end, at the, at the treble end, at 20k we don't even this would be the minus 1 db down point we don't even quite get there but in in between it's it's, it's dead flat right it's very flat what happens when you zoom this in i we had to zoom it out so that people could see the whole thing if we zoom in as far as we can go the variation along this line is no larger than i believe 0.3 of a db yeah, so it's it's pretty darn flat even in in a big zoom in eh? yes okay wonderful i was actually surprised that it was that flat um but maybe i shouldn't the amp when you you know version one sounded fantastic and all the way through to version seven i actually built version eight with a little bit of feedback and i slept on the sound overnight and i woke up with the one thought <laughs> i'm i'm connect the the temporary negative feedback circuit. I'd spent a good chunk of a day fooling around with it and it just wrecked the sound. And when I went back to pure class A, oh my goodness, I was just so happy. <laughs> so we, well, I've actually built full eight versions and we went backwards to version seven. Okay, so what have we got here, Charles? So this is a visual representation of the distortion of the amplifier before we were able to start tuning it.
Right, so this is the amp that I handed over to you for testing that I thought already sounded great. Exactly. Okay, so up here is our signal. That's our signal. And down here, what's this this line? This is the second harmonic. That's the beneficial harmonic that we, we find pleasing in music. And the discordant harmonics are the odd ones. So mm -hmm. evens are good, so second, four, six, eight are good. But third is very bad. The human human brain ear combination does not like hearing third harmonics. And we didn't like it that close to the second and that high up off the noise. Yeah, it doesn't look like it's not that far down, in the low end especially. Mm -hmm. So this is the low end, this is the high end, right? What about these big spikes? We've got one at 60 and one at 120. So this monster up here, 60 hertz of course is your main supply. So we know that this is on the primary side of the power power supply on the primary side of the transformer. So this could be the plug-in, it, it could be um, it could be the wiring at the switch, but it's getting into the amp, into the actual signal. And over here at 120, when you rectify a 60 hertz and you have your B+, plus, which we power the amp with, you double the frequency, so you're at 120 now. And it's spiky too. We couldn't hear this though, could we? Even with very efficient speakers. We couldn't, but we didn't like how close it was getting to the second harmonic level and how far up it was off the noise floor, so we decided to do, to do something about it. That's right, we started tweaking and I think we were only at it for an afternoon, weren't we? Exactly, and this is the, how big of a difference it made here. So this is, what, this is the final version of the kit amp, at least as far as we can drag the design, and actually it wasn't hard to design this amp. So here's our very flat signal up here at 0 dB. Mm -hmm. And we're going to see a boosted second harmonic, which is what we like. So it came up a little bit when we tweaked it, but what happened to the third? The third dropped and moved away from the second harmonic and a lot closer to the noise floor. Right, so in fact it's literally just touching the noise floor and if we wanted to suppress the third harmonic, we could have filtered it more heavily and dropped it down, couldn't we? We could, and actually we did try that, but whenever we did filter more to remove the third harmonic, we saw the second harmonic drop drastically. Yep, in fact we almost brought it down to here, didn't we? We it did. It almost went away. I mean, at this point we're, we're, at the worst, we're just a little under minus 60 dB. That's, that's not easy to hear unless you have very efficient speakers and you turn them up. Mm -hmm. And we also, in that, in that, those tweaks, we got the 60 hertz and the 120 hertz spikes way down. So they're well below um, anything that you can hear until you put the volume up on max. And even then, you, uh, we have to get our ears up right into the tweeter to start to even get a hint that they're there, don't we? Well, right up to them. And I think we dropped them by uh, at least 15 dB with right. the modifications. We couldn't hear them before, but you definitely can't hear them now. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks Charles. I mean, the, the, what you've done in bringing this testing capability and all of your computer skills have just been, uh, and you know, you've been helping, um, helping get tubes into the inventory, finding great tubes. In fact, we're going to look at those in just a minute. So thanks so much for, you know, joining the, joining the little business and uh, for all this great work. Oh, you're very welcome, and uh, I guess I better get back to work, but I hope to see you all soon. Okay, great. Thanks, Charles. Okay, let's clear the decks and see what came in this week. Now, these are really interesting tubes. Let me just grab a knife. Oh, maybe I've lost my knife. I, I put my knife down in exactly the same spot every time until I start filming. <laughs> And then it, it goes walkies. Maybe because I'm not paying attention, it figures it's it's free and it can start running. So these are boxed Electro Home, but the tubes have clearly stated on them that they're made in Japan. Now they're new old stock, new in the box, but they've got that, you know, that really flaky white paint that just uh, just falls off. You just have to lightly touch it and it's gone. So you can't even see it on this particular tube, but they, they all say they're made in Japan and they're really beautiful tubes. They've got a, a tall bottle, but they've got uh, a very interesting black, short black plate with two ribs 
and they've got a tall, I call it a stock getter. Can, can I get it on camera? It's hard because of all the, the gettering. There you go. You see how long the getter stock is? And then they actually angled the halo getter so that the chrome dome is not consistent. You can see here it's, it's the, the gettering is angled, right? Because that halo, of course, carries the metals that get flashed off to form, um, to form our gettering. Which, of course, the only job of the getter and the gettering is to maintain the vacuum, right? Is to absorb stray molecules. Um, so a good indication of the life of a tube is how much of this remains. And, of course, this is a brand new tube. Even though it probably was made about, I'm going to guess, sometime in the 70s, maybe early 70s. So it's, it's, it's at least a 40-year-old tube, maybe a 50-year-old tube. But it looks very much like the Sylvania Millspec 6SL7WGT, I believe is the number. They had brown bases and um, they were, uh, they are very low noise tubes. They're great sounding tubes. If you want a low distortion, very clear sounding tube, that's the tube. So when Charles found a whole bunch of these, well, a small bunch, in fact, I'll show you in a minute. Um, he found basically a flight uh, an interesting flight. I just have to try these. So uh, we did a listening test this morning and they are very much like the Sylvania mill spec tube. They're very low noise. They're very clean and clear. Just a really terrific 6SL7. Now we were trying it in the Wilson R8, which is the only amp I have that takes a 6SL7. And th in that amp, they're in the driver's spot. So, sorry, they're in the preamp slot. So the, it's a key tube for that amp. So you really can hear the tubes that are in that preamp slot. So I was very impressed. These are really nice. Uh, I've actually paired these up with the uh, German gold set that I put in the, uh, um, in the store. So they're paired up with the RFTs because that's also a very clean and clear sounding tube. Okay, so those are in the store now. Uh, let me grab... Let me just grab the flight. Now, normally flights or sleeves, I think I'm talking beer. Uh, I can't even drink beer anymore. Why am I thinking about beer? Anyways, normally a sleeve is five tubes for uh, preamps, octals, uh, nine pins, um, and even power to tubes came in sleeves of, of five. They, sometimes they came in quad, quad sleeves and sometimes they came as matched pairs. But look at this, it, this came as 10. <laughs> I've never actually seen a, a sleeve of 10. Isn't that neat? And the numbers are all really tight. I, don't know, I think I got it upside down, but you can see here, uh, I had, uh, I think we found 14 match tubes. They're all basically from the same lot. And uh, I think I got, um, I got five or six uh, matched pairs. Okay, let's keep moving. And talking about sleeves, look at this. Here's some more tubes that Charles found. Uh, if you've followed me, you know I have some favorite tubes. And one of my favorite preamp tubes is the E80CC. It's just, it's basically a higher spec 12AU7, basically. Um, and even in some cases, you can make a direct sub, some cases. Uh, I did a whole video on this. Let's pop these off. We've got Westinghouse, really nice boxes, vintage boxes. This is... If you want to get a rough idea of how old your tube is, look at the design of the box if you've got one. And if it's a military box, of course, you're going to have some dates, hopefully. In this case, this is for domestic use. But let's take a peek inside and see what we've got. Westinghouse rebranded, but gold pin. So, ah, so these are probably Phillips E80CC. Um, and yes, and the way to tell them apart from the other types, Tungs Ram is the main, the main tube that was made uh, in any numbers that you'll find. The rest of them are mostly Philips rebrands. There, there's a couple of manufacturers, but I've never actually seen those tubes, so they're not that common, at least not in North America. Maybe in Europe you'll find them. But on the real Philips, they only have two little slots. And of course, they're going to have the the Phillips manufacturing code. And there it is. I don't know if I can get it on camera, 
but it's got the backwards upright triangle. That's it's got a name for it, but I don't. I never remember what the hell that is. And it's got a really clear manufacturing code. So we've got the date, the tube type, and the plant. So the plant is is Heerlen in Holland, and that's the main Phillips plant. They had lots of them all over the world, but that's the that's the biggie. That would be like the equivalent of um, Blackburn for, for Mullard. And in fact, Phillips owned Mullard, right? So th these are just wonderful sounding tubes. In fact, I like them so much, I designed a preamp right around them. So the one of the kit preamps is the E80CC. And it is just absolutely clean and clear with an enormous amount of drive. And I would like to create, take credit for um, the design work. But really, it comes down to a great tube. Uh, any designer that starts with a great tube has, you know, a huge leg up. Okay, a whole bunch of these. I'll have them in the store. Uh, new stock, new in the box. It's just to find sleeves of E80CCs like this is just so unusual. So I'll get them in the store this weekend. And, uh, of course, I'm building up inventory of the E80CC. It's in the wrong sleeve. Look, it's in the hit race sleeve. Uh, another one in the hit race sleeve. I have to see if I got some Westinghouse sleeves. Um, but most people are only going to buy a match pair anyway. So you're not getting a sleeve unless you buy all all five of them. <laughs> oh, and I saved the best to last. Have a look at this. We're, we're, all, all, we're running over time, so we better wrap this show up. But I just have to show you this. Look at these boxes. Mill spec boxes, right? U.S. Army, U.S. Navy, Jan, CHY, 1625. What the heck is a 1625? Well, the 807 was a really well-known um, power tube. It was used um, in uh, amateur radio, and um, it was also used in home-built amplifiers. It was a really big tube for home builders a long a while ago, way back, <laughs> way back when. Uh, whenever I get together with an old guy to talk about equipment or tubes that he has for sale, they almost all invariably start talking about the 807 tube. So this is the 12 volt version of the 807. And let me just see, one of these boxes was opened. They're all stapled together solid. I should have made a notice to which one. Here it is. Look at the way they're nestled in there. Isn't that just I love the way vintage boxes took care of their tubes. Let's just back it a little bit and get that back on camera for you. Look at that. They're all, the 807, of course, had a top cap. And and here we've got, in this case, we've got the, the seven pin base. And with these early bases, you can always tell which ones are the heater pins because they are always the two large pins. There you go. So those are the heaters. And of course we have a nice smoke tube and that's to reduce interference. And, you know, I just couldn't resist this. I don't know if I'll ever get around to building a prototype for these tubes, but I've got some to play with now, so isn't that great? Okay, if you stay till the end, here's some discount codes to help you out. And remember I've got, um, I've got, $20 shipping, flat rate $20 shipping around the world. And I've got free shipping if your order is $150 or more after discount. And talking about discounts, there's a couple of secret discount codes in the store. And some of you have been really good at finding them. You're costing me money. <laughs> but uh, one of them is easy to figure out. I'm not going to give any more hints than that. The other one is way back in a video a long time ago. And I'll give you a hint. It involves Mullard. Okay, that's all you're getting. Uh, stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vells and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.